Good morning, everyone. I appreciate everyone tuning in. Today we'll hear from Secretary French for our weekly education update, as well as Deputy Secretary Samuelson and Dr. Levine for our usual vaccine and health updates. This afternoon, we'll also be paying very close attention to the advisory committee uh, discussion about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. It's my hope that after the committee finishes its meeting, the CDC and FDA will move quickly on their recommendations, perhaps even tonight or tomorrow. In Vermont, we're preparing for a resumption of the use of these vaccines, uh, so we're ready if all goes well. If the feds give the green light, we'll be ready to start using J&J &J again next week, which will be helpful in so many ways. But I want to assure everyone, even without the J&J, &J, we're still on pace to have more than 60% of adult Vermonters vaccinated with at least one dose by May 1. If the pause is lifted, it will allow us to further accelerate. So I want to thank Vermonters again for doing their part in signing up, uh, among many other uh, things in this pandemic. Vermont is a national leader in both rate of vaccine administration uh, and the percentage of our population being fully vaccinated. And that is because of all of you, and thanks to all of you, helping yourselves and your communities by getting the vaccine. We're really fortunate to have all these choices, all these vaccines uh, that are safe, effective, and will allow us to do many of the things we've missed over the last 14 months. Next, as uh, you'll remember from last week, Senator Sanders and I talked about our work to expand summer programs for our youth. Uh, together with the Agency of Education, Vermont After School, and others, our goal to make sure kids can reconnect with their friends and have some fun this summer after missing out on so much over the last year. This week, Senator Sanders and I met with superintendents from across the state to hear about their plans and I was really encouraged uh, by what I heard. I want to thank them for working with us to help build a great summer for our kids. For parents out there looking for opportunity for your kids, you can view a map of available camps on vermontafterschool.org. So far, there are over 400 offerings listed, with more on the way, and that's enough capacity to welcome over 30,000 kids. We're working to make these programs accessible, affordable, and impactful for our youth. So please take a look if you have, a, have an opportunity. One uh, obstacle we heard about uh, from the superintendents, and this is true for many sectors, is staffing. Uh, there are currently many full and part-time positions available this summer across the state. Uh, the more people our summer programs can hire, the more kids we'll be able to reach. So this is a great opportunity uh, to step up for our youth and spend the summer having some fun. Vermont After School has a full page, has a page for people interested in these jobs. Uh, this is open to high school uh, as well as college students looking for a summer job or college credits. Uh, and it really does bring back memories for me. When I was 15, I was a camp counselor at Lotus Lake Camp uh, as a woodworking instructor. So again, if you're interested, uh, visit vermontafterschool.org. Lastly, ACCD will issue our full summer camp guidance within the next 24 to 48 hours. And we'll discuss it at Tuesday's press conference in greater detail. But uh, stay tuned for that. Look for it. Uh, it will be up on their website uh, over the weekend. Uh, with that, I'll now turn it over to Secretary French for his education update. Secretary French. Thank you, Governor. Uh, good morning. I'll begin my update uh, with a review of the PCR surveillance testing in our schools from this week. This was vacation week for some of our schools, uh, so the participation rate was uh, much lower than normal. This week, we tested about 226 staff, which is about 20% of the number we usually test. To date, this testing has identified no positive cases of COVID-19. This is the third week in a row the testing did not identify a single case. 
This means uh, the positivity rate for school staff has been 0% for the month of April so far, and the state positivity rate remains low at 1.5%. With the vaccination of school staff nearly complete, uh, we have decided to end the surveillance testing program for school staff after next week. In its place, we are working with the health department to organize a pilot surveillance testing program for students in schools and summer programs. We'll be using new funding from the CDC to pay for the program. Uh, this program is still being organized and we'll have updates on it in the coming weeks. The USDA announced this week that it is extending program flexibility for the student meal programs through June of 2022. This will enable schools to operate these programs next year in response to changing conditions of the virus and will also provide additional financial subsidies. We are in the process of understanding the specific implications of this announcement and we will follow up with additional guidance and communications as we get more information. Our initial reaction is this is welcome news and will certainly help support the food security needs of our children during what has been a very challenging time for many of our families. On a similar note, we received the first guidance on ESSER 3 funds from the U.S. Department of Education yesterday in the form of an interim final rule that describes how the funds need to be administered. The ESSER program has been the primary vehicle for federal K-12 relief during the pandemic. Vermont's K-12 education system will receive about $285 million under this ESSER 3 program, with 10% of the funding being reserved for state-level support and 90% going directly to school districts. In the guidance that was issued yesterday, the U.S. Department of Education clarified that the Agency of Education is the recipient of these funds, and the agency is responsible for developing a plan for how to spend the state-level funds. We will now begin the work of developing the spending plan. The agency is required to develop the plan through a formal process of stakeholder engagement and public comment, and we will use the priorities that emerge from the district-level recovery planning guide to guide the initial drafting of our plan. Uh, lastly, we will be issuing guidance on graduations and end of school year celebrations this afternoon. Both graduations and end of school year celebrations, including proms, will be permitted, uh, but we'll need to follow the safety requirements outlined in our Safe and Healthy Schools guidance and the Vermont Forward Plan. These celebrations are not only being permitted this year, but also being strongly encouraged. This has been a long year for our students in our schools, and we want to do whatever we can to ensure the school year ends in a safe and celebratory way. That concludes my update. I'll now turn it over to Deputy Secretary Samuelson. Good morning. I'm De Deputy Secretary Jenny Samuelson of the Agency of Human Services. Today I will provide an update on the progress with vaccinations. As it's already been mentioned, the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices is meeting today to review the data on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. We hope to have more information later this afternoon, and during, but during this pause, we have been watching closely and planning. Depending on the outcomes of the Advisory Committee, we could begin vaccinating as early as Tuesday in the Northeast Kingdom. If a recommendation comes out this evening, We'll likely have more specific information to share with on Vermont's plans as early as Saturday morning. I am happy to share that we have reached another milestone this week. More than 300,000 people have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. We are making great progress, and at 56% of eligible Vermonters vaccinated, with at least one dose, we are, we are closing in on achieving the second steps in Governor Scott's Vermont Forward Plan. I also want to let you know that on, July, on April 29th, we will open registration to out-of-state college students and part-time Vermont residents. You can make an appointment on the state's website at healthvermont.gov backslash myvaccine. Um, if you are unable to sign up online, you can call 855 722-7878. Turning to BIPOC Vermonters, we continue to make good progress. As of today, 52% of BIPOC Vermonters have been, have been vaccinated or have made an appointment. In terms of our overall progress, as of this morning, 305,100 people have been vaccinated against COVID-19. 
94,900 people have received their first dose of vaccine, and 210 and 200 people have received 210,200 people have received their first and last dose. In closing, it's critical that we all do our part um, to end this pandemic. I want to encourage those who have not yet made an appointment to get vaccinated to do so as soon as they are able. At this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine for the health update. Thank you and good morning. <clears throat> Our data continues to move in a very positive direction as we are seeing more consecutive days where daily reported cases are under 100 now. We've seen about a 36% decline in cases in the past two weeks. Hospitalizations remain relatively stable at 26 today with five people in the ICU. Our positivity rate has dramatically decreased to 1.2%. So while illness among anyone is always a concern, we do appear to be on a better overall trajectory at this time. We continue to see two powerful forces at play in our pandemic landscape, variants of the virus and vaccination. As you know, they're working in opposite directions, both here in Vermont and nationally. And despite the good news in our case data, we cannot let up on our efforts to vaccinate Vermonters as quickly as we can in preventing spread of the virus. Across the US, the B117 variant continues to represent an increasing proportion of the circulating virus. The CDC estimates that it accounted for nearly 45% of circulating virus in the two weeks ending March 27th. Although our numbers in Vermont are too small to calculate the proportion of B117 with certainty, well over 50% of the specimens that we've sent for whole genome sequencing are returning as this variant. We've also seen the B1429 variant in several Vermont counties. And the P1 variant was also recently confirmed in a small number of Rutland and Wyndham County residents. Speaking of these variants, though, if the B117 and B1429 were able to evade the vaccines to any significant degree, I would expect increased transmission of the virus but we are, of course, seeing the opposite right now, a cause for cautious optimism. And this is a great time to remind unvaccinated Vermonters and those not yet fully vaccinated who have traveled out of state to obtain a test within three days of their return. Test opportunities are widespread and readily available. As you just heard, on the vaccine front, we're now over 55% of Vermonters 16 and older having received at least one dose of vaccine, and 38% who've completed vaccination. I continue to be quite proud of this progress and thank each and every Vermonter who's protecting themselves, their families, and their community. As I've noted before, we are now at the time in the vaccination effort where the impact on cases should become apparent and seems to be doing so. Now that everyone 16 and up are eligible for vaccination, I hope you'll join me in helping anyone you know who may not have made an appointment yet to do so, especially in our younger groups where we would like to see even more uptake. Maybe you're concerned about side effects and need encouragement, so talk to a trusted healthcare provider. Or if you haven't yet found an easy time or location, Maybe you need childcare or a ride. Or you might still need a meaningful reason for yourself. Because although many of us have shared experiences during this pandemic, we all still have personal reasons as to why we might get vaccinated. To feel safe, to restart our social lives, less financial stress, or to protect our children, or any one of a number of reasons. Or maybe you are waiting to see what happens with the J&J &J vaccine, 
which I've been hearing from a lot of people regarding just that point. I fully expect a definitive decision today. The meeting of the ACIP began about 25 minutes ago and will be ending at the end of the day, followed shortly thereafter by FDA and CDC decisions. We will be preparing guidance for Vermonters and for Vermont clinicians this evening. And if there are no major stipulations on who should be offered the vaccine, we will, de we will then develop even more opportunities for how to access this vaccine, including the opportunity referred to by Deputy Secretary Samuelson in Essex County. Whatever the case may be, we can support one another and keep improving our reach to more Vermonters because every person who chooses to get vaccinated brings us all a step closer to moving past the COVID-19 pandemic. Finally, I'd like to end on a somewhat different note, one that I've raised uh, at various points in the pandemic regarding um, substance misuse. Throughout the pandemic, we've continued efforts to meet all ongoing public health needs. And COVID-19 has certainly created unique challenges for people with substance use disorder, including isolation and mental and emotional pressures that contribute to their disease. So I want to remind everyone in a spirit of prevention that tomorrow is Take Back Day, something we made a big deal of many times in the past, and I don't want it to be overshadowed by the pandemic. More than half of the people who misuse prescription drugs get it from a friend or relative, often straight out of the medicine cabinet. If you no longer need your medication, please do your part and dispose of it safely. Take a few minutes this weekend to go through your medicine cabinets and safely dispose of unused and unwanted prescription and over-the-counter drugs, especially prescription painkillers. This simple act makes a huge difference in preventing misuse and diversion. Please visit healthvermont.gov slash do your part for more information about take back disposal sites near you, as well as to request a free medication mailback envelope. You can get that from us at the health department. You can often get that in a pharmacy. It allows you 365 day a year opportunity to get rid of unused and unwanted medications. And as always, help is available when and where you need it. If you or someone you know is struggling with substance use, visit vermonthelplink.org, that's vthelplink.org, for support and referral services. I'll turn this back to the governor now. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Now I'll open it up to questions. All right, starting with Calvin Cutler, WCAX. Um, thanks, Governor. So you, you may have seen today that uh, New York City is opening up um, vaccination appointments to walk-ins. You don't have to have an appointment. And in some states, um, they're actually asking for fewer vaccines because uh, the, the uptake isn't as high. So I guess uh, my question is, you know, are, are we seeing the demand slow down in any counties here in Vermont? And uh, if the J and J vaccine goes forward as well, what do you envision demand looking, uh, the demand looking like for that? Yeah, you know there are certain areas of our state that have either slowed down or never had the uptick. Uh, that's why we've concentrated, for instance, on the Northeast Kingdom. That's why, if uh, if the vaccine, uh, the J and J vaccine is uh, approved, the pause is lifted th this afternoon. Uh, we'll be concentrating uh, more first on. The Northeast Kingdom. Uh, other areas are seeing a high demand still. Um, so uh, in some respects, um, I don't know if that's good news or bad news, but I'm going to take it as good news because we still have a lot of folks that want to have uh, to be vaccinated. And that's what we're striving for. Other states talking with other governors, uh, they really are struggling uh, to find enough people uh, to, to meet uh, the supply that they're having uh, come in their doors. So they're, uh, they're in the uncomfortable position of turning that away. Uh, we're not there uh, anywhere near that at this point, but it's going to come to that uh, pretty soon. 
uh, again, when you look at our numbers, I mean, we're, as far as the administration uh, of, uh, of, of the vaccine and the uh, policies we've adopted puts us in the top three to top five um, consistently in a number of categories. So we're doing something right and Vermonters are doing something right, um, but there, there may come a time when the uh, supply is going to uh, overwhelm the demand and uh, and then we'll be adopting similar policies. We're starting to talk about that now um, to be prepared so that we might have some walk-in opportunities and so forth. But but right now today um, we're in uh, we're in pretty good shape and the uh, registration process is working well. And then I guess my second question I think might be either for you or Secretary French. Um, you know the state as you mentioned is putting together this continuity continuity of learning uh, plan for the summer. So I'm just kind of wondering, you know, number one, what, what will that look like? And um, what will it cost families as well? What will be the average cost for some of these uh, camps? Well, again, um, as Senator Sanders has consistently said, and he was able to um, funnel money uh, to uh, for these programs. Uh, that's why we're speaking with some of the superintendents as well to use some of the funds they had uh, to to initiate this it was it was uh, pointed towards a summer and after school programs so um, our goal is to have it uh, it either be free or a, a small amount of money um, but uh, we don't we want to make sure that it's accessible uh, to the majority of kids regardless of their zip code regardless of their um, the means of their their families uh, we want them to take advantage of this because it's really important. We've we've said this consistently. Getting kids back in school for in-person instruction uh, was about the the social needs and mental health of our kids. Same is true here. We want them to have some sort of a, a normal uh, summer and then uh, uh, trans uh, transition to in-person instruction by fall. And, and a number of schools uh, at this point in time after the the break uh, this week, we'll be going back to uh, more in, uh, remote or more in-person learning. So we're, uh, we're encouraged by that sign. I'll, I'll let um, Secretary French answer further on that, uh, on that point in terms of, of um, what we're seeing as we move forward. Yeah, thank you, Governor. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of activity going on now in this area, particularly uh, as a part of the recovery planning process, but uh, particularly focused on summer. And um, to your question, we have uh, sort of parallel things going on in terms of planning. On the one hand, uh, we have the recovery planning that the school districts are engaged in, and that's a result of, uh, you know, planning for the next phase of the pandemic, but specifically about how to utilize the federal funding uh, that's coming into the state. On, on a sort of a parallel track, we also have a coordinated activity happening at the state level, and this is through Vermont After School, uh, to expand the capacity of programs statewide so there's more options uh, for students and families across the state that include not only schools, uh, but, but summer camps and so forth. We just want to ensure that there are um, a, a large number of activities available for all students this summer so they can uh, get outside, reconnect with their communities so their, and schools and so forth. So that's that's sort of the overarching construct um, right now. You know, again, to echo the governor's uh, observations, I think it's been a tremendous success so far. I mean, things are really coming together very well. Uh, things are moving in the right direction. So we couldn't be more pleased uh, with the support from schools and the community stepping up. And Vermont After School has been, been wonderful and sort of leading us. So I think it's going to be a great summer. Uh, Secretary, do you do you envision every single student uh, moving on to the next grade, or do you think some districts might make the decision or or have um, have kids stay back and, and repeat grades? Yeah, that's that's a question that's really handled at the local level. Um, school districts are required to have a policy on retention. Uh, for example, uh, you know, certainly this this policy was more uh, typically enacted in a way. Uh, prior to the pandemic, and you can imagine how that plays out differently at the different grade levels. So, you know, decisions on retention for students in the primary grades, for example, are fundamentally different than the decisions around uh, retention for students at the high school level, which is largely based on passing courses and making progress towards meeting graduation requirements. Uh, so those kinds of issues are all being sorted out at the local level, which is where they should be sorted out. And um, 
we haven't heard a lot of conversation yet um, around particularly progress towards high school graduation, um, but I expect that conversation will emerge here in the next week or so um, as, as districts come back from their April vacations. Steve? Uh, given the um, fact that we're probably going to hit 60% between now and, and next weekend, um, where are we at? Possibly for outdoor uh, events and masking-wise, uh, for spectators and parents and and such, We're, are we looking at changing that guidance a little bit? Or yeah, I, think I mentioned that either on Tuesday or last week uh, that we are looking uh, at uh, whether how long uh, the outdoor masking uh, will be required. Um, so I think you can expect uh, sometime uh, in the next couple of weeks that we'll have some guidance on that. We're not quite there yet, but uh, we are certainly talking about that right now. Liz, NBC5. Um, I know we're still waiting for new, a word on Johnson & Johnson, um, but if we get the green light from the CDC and the FDA, how soon do you think you'd be able to administer shots? Because I know of a couple people who have appointments on Monday. At this point, do you think those people will be able to get the J&J &J if we do get the green light today? It, it will be close. Um, I don't know if, if it will be Monday, uh, certainly Tuesday. Um, but um, but maybe Deputy Secretary Samuelson will be able to answer that. So for the few appointments that we still have um, in the schedule, um, they are mainly with our pharmacy partners. Um, our pharmacy partners will need to look at and respond to the, uh, the guidance that comes out this afternoon. It is anticipated, um, as the governor said, that we definitely will be ready to go on Tuesday. Um, depending on what the guidance is this afternoon, we'll be able to make decisions with our pharmacy partners about the, those that are scheduled on Monday. I have a question for Dr. Levine. Um, we spoke to a person, or a woman, who claims just five days after she received her first dose of the Pfizer vaccine that she had to go to the emergency room, and from there she was diagnosed with Bell's palsy. Have you heard of this reaction, and do you recommend that this person skip the second dose or continue to move forward? Yes, so Bell's palsy has been reported not just with this vaccine, but with vaccines for a variety of diseases uh, over the years and decades. So it's not an unknown side effect. Um, whether her side effect is related to the vaccine or another factor, uh, she would have to investigate with her healthcare provider because there are a number of other known causes of Bell's palsy. The um, reality is, if it is related to the vaccine, it is a distinctly uncommon side effect um, and um, would not be seen in huge numbers in any of the trials that uh, have been gone ongoing to date. Uh, I wouldn't want to advise her on the second dose again because she needs to be assured uh, by a healthcare professional who knows her case specifically that there is no other cause except potentially the vaccine before she makes a decision about the second dose. Someone like her, though, if it were actually associated with the uh, vaccine, um, that would still not potentially preclude her from getting another type of COVID vaccine. Um, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Lisa, DAP. Uh, thanks. This is also a question for Dr. Levine. Um, as I'm sure you know, the Washington University released that study yesterday about the increased risk um, that COVID survivors, even who had mild illness, faced um, months after they've been sick. I was wondering, is the health department monitoring or plan to monitoring COVID survivors in Vermont for any lingering illness or for deaths months later? I know you already have plenty to do, but I was wondering about that. Yeah, no, thanks for the question. Um, and the, the CDC came out with information um, that I guess is going to be embargoed for a short time, but it's uh, probably available this afternoon, that also speaks to um, what impact having COVID has. So this allows me to repeat a theme I've mentioned many times here, which is uh, to those who think, well, I don't need the vaccine. If I get the illness, it's not a big deal. Uh, it'll be done and over with, and then I'll still have some immunity. 
Uh, these kinds of studies remind us that it is not always a benign condition. It is not always something that has no long-term ramifications on someone's health. Um, the description of the people that were uh, observed in these uh, studies are that they had not very significant cases of COVID. They were oftentimes very mild. Yet, <clears throat> when you look at their healthcare expenditures, look at their times to revisit the healthcare uh, provider community, um, they were at higher rates than you might expect after having had such a benign illness. Some of them had more chronic symptoms that developed as well. Um, I don't want to emphasize death because that, that was not as significant a, a finding with regard to these kinds of patients that I'm talking about. So don't, my, my word of uh, caution to Vermonters, especially those who might feel like they may not really need the vaccine, is do not underestimate this virus. And don't underestimate the fact that you could have long-term symptoms. Now, with regard to what the health department's doing, um, you know, most of our interactions with a person who tests positive occur very immediately. And then we allow them to have communication with us and encourage that through either the Sarah Alert uh, app that we provide or other means uh, during the ensuing weeks. Uh, certainly if they develop uh, in, in symptoms they're concerned about, uh, if they don't uh, lose any of their symptoms and are wondering how to reintegrate back into work and et cetera. So we communicate with them then. We don't actually follow them long term. <clears throat> However, that's been one of the reasons I've been pushing uh, very strongly for our own within Vermont study of people long term with COVID. And we're very close to beginning that study in a more prospective way uh, now to understand this whole syndrome called long COVID or long haul COVID, depending on what label you'd like to use, um, which is not everyone. Some people have symptoms and they go away after three or four months, but these are people whose symptoms persist three months plus and uh, don't seem to go away, whether they be fatigue, shortness of breath, exercise intolerance, brain fog as it's called, or other symptoms. So the bottom line is, uh, we're going to be embarking on some study of that, but we don't have a lot of data regarding the people who've had COVID already in Vermont and how many of them do or do not have persistent symptoms. I did have an opportunity to speak with a support group uh, a couple of nights ago, um, and um, there were not, you know, there were people there, obviously, and they had very uh, compelling stories to tell, but at the same time, um, it was not a large, large group. Um, that's, all, uh, that's not totally representative of the whole Vermont population, I realize, um, but we're not aware of large numbers of people who uh, feel that their symptoms are persisting. But clearly we know that there is a number of them out there and uh, we want them to be able to be able to turn to aspects of the healthcare community to uh, have their stories heard and have any interventions provided that could be useful for them. Okay, and then also, um, thank you for that. You mentioned earlier that um, you'd like to see, or the health department would like to see more young people get vaccinated. What, what is the percentage now, and, and what would you be comfortable with seeing? I'm sure you'd like to see them all get vaccinated, but um, is there a certain percentage that you're looking for? <clears throat> Well, you know, we've set a goal for most of our age strata, if you will, in the 80% plus range. Um, and that's how we've been doing a lot of our projections. I think the most recent group that we opened up um, in that window over the weekend that passed already was uh, the 16, 17, and 18 year olds. And I think we're in the 55% range or so of them, is that true? 41% range of them. And then in the um, next strata? Sorry, Dr. Levine, it's 50% in the, in the 16 and the 18. It is. 41 in the, the 19. Okay. 50% in the 16 to 18, and 41% going up to age 29. 
So certainly okay. we, and, and I do know we have a number of people in that latter age band that are awaiting Johnson & Johnson. Uh, so we will see with great interest if Johnson & Johnson is returned to its former status with no major restrictions or concerns, uh, how many in that age group uh, are joyous about that and immediately start scheduling appointments. I see. Okay. Thank you very much. If I could just add to the uh, Johnson & Johnson issue, uh, just as a reminder, we, we don't have a lot of inventory uh, at this point in time. So I, I think we have maybe in the state supply uh, under 1,000 doses. Uh, and, but, the, but the pharmacies, which aren't in our control, have uh, an inventory as well. So uh, we can get started this week, um, but a lot of it will rely on uh, what we do in the future, will rely on what they tell us on Tuesday. Uh, so when we have our White House call on Tuesday, uh, they will tell us if, um, if the pause is lifted, how much they're going to ship us. And that will uh, be a, a big factor in what we do in the future uh, over the next week or so in terms of uh, uh, vaccination clinics with Johnson Johnson uh, vaccine. Mike Donahue, The Islander. Thanks, uh, Jason. Uh, Governor, we've heard from a number of people, especially women, deeply concerned about the Johnson Johnson vaccine shot, if and when it does get approval to restart. What are the latest numbers of Vermonters failing to show up for their vaccine appointments? And the state has to be thinking that the number of no-shows may grow uh, once Johnson & Johnson is there or that people may walk away. Uh, I know it was one in a million aren't great odds uh, for the problem with Johnson & Johnson, unless you're the, that happened to be that one. But what steps will the state take to get Pfizer or Moderna shots into these people that may not want Johnson & Johnson? Yeah, well, keep in mind uh, first uh, that the CDC, uh, FDA, the, the, uh, they're meeting, they'll be meeting with the recommendations of that committee uh, after um, this meeting ends at five o'clock tonight, I would imagine. And, uh, and there may be some restrictions uh, involved in, in who gets it and uh, age categories and so forth, or there may not be anything at all. We just don't know at this point. It's up to them. Um, so we will uh, certainly, uh, that will be a consideration in terms of uh, making sure that everyone understands what those restrictions are before they sign up. Uh, secondly, uh, we, we're not forcing anyone uh, to have the Johnson Johnson. Um, I had uh, Johnson Johnson myself, as did my wife, uh, but, uh, but this is going to be a choice. Uh, we're not forcing you to have that. So there will be uh, Pfizer and Moderna available for you if you want to wait for that. Um, as I said, if they didn't, uh, if they didn't lift the, the, the pause, um, we would still uh, I believe, meet our goals uh, over the next couple of months. Uh, so with or without it, uh, we'll still be there, uh, but with it, uh, Johnson Johnson, it will certainly accelerate uh, us getting to some sort of normalcy in the next couple of months. But truly, a uh, choice. This isn't something that we would force anybody to do. Anything else, Dr. So, Levine? So what are the latest numbers? What, what are the latest numbers I, of Vermonters? Yeah, I don't know. To show up for yeah, I don't know if we we have those. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that we do. We had to cancel uh, a number of them and reschedule uh, them because of the uh, Johnson Johnson. Uh, and we ha we know uh, I know of a few people who are waiting for Johnson Johnson. That's what they want. So they aren't um, they aren't interested in uh, the Pfizer Moderna. So I think it's going to be a, a mixed uh, bag, so to speak. Uh, there are going to be some who are going to want the Johnson Johnson, others who may not want it at all, but they'll have Pfizer and Moderna um, to uh, to choose from. So uh, it's it's difficult to say at this point who's not showing up because we're not offering the Johnson Johnson right now. So we'll see what happens after uh, after today. Dr. Levine. And just the only thing to add to that is. Obviously, the person who was scheduled in the last several weeks for Johnson & Johnson 
didn't have an appointment to not show up for because that was canceled. But they were all provided with the opportunity to have a Pfizer or Moderna appointment within the same time frame, so they wouldn't have to move to the end of the line because of what happened at the federal government level. They could actually get Pfizer or Moderna within the same number of weeks as their Johnson & Johnson appointment had been already scheduled for. Um, and some took advantage of that for sure, and those who want to wait will just wait until Johnson & Johnson is available again and either go through the pharmacies or the state registration site to access that. Okay, and uh, Governor, uh, Reader is inquiring that there may be some movement on increasing the number of spectators at high school games. I think it's 150 right now. Uh, are those numbers going up and if people are doubly vaccinated, uh, does that count? Yeah. Or the 150 a reader wants to know? Yeah, no, actually the, the 150 is unvaccinated. Um, you can have as many vaccinated people over that number, fully vaccinated people over that number as you want. Uh, so that is flexible. Uh, Secretary Curley, um, have I got that right? Uh, Governor, I was actually hoping maybe Sec Secretary Moore would sign in, uh, join in, but I do believe it's as of May 1st, we go to that 300, just yeah. to be clear. Right, right. It's it's still going to follow the guidance that we put into place in the in the steps. So, uh, the next step is May one, which we we feel we're going to hit, and uh, whatever the uh, the attendance, uh, the gathering size is in that category, is what we'll adhere to. But it, but the point is, um, the, if it's 150, uh, that's unvaccinated, and we will uh, allow any number of uh, uh, vaccinated, uh, fully vaccinated. Uh, people to come and gather at those um, at those events. Those are outdoor events. Great. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Um, thank you. Uh, I have a question that you may have answered in the past, but maybe it's different now. Um, in an office where um, the public does not come um, and um, all the people who work there are fully vaccinated, that is two weeks after their second shot, um, are masks still required? Yeah, I believe so, um, Joe, but I will refer to Dr. Levine or Deputy Secretary Samuelson for that. That would still fall, you know, as we enter the months of May and June in the, in the universal guidance part of our uh, Vermont Forward Plan. Um, so it would involve masking in that setting. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Howard, VPR. Yeah, I think. Secretary uh, Samuelson, we learned last week that FEMA was giving the state about $46 million for the motel program, and I'm wondering if you could give us a little information on that. Can that money be used to purchase motels, or is that just going to continue um, paying rent, so to speak? And, you know, how long do you think that will carry the state, and what is the long-term plan beyond that if the state's spending about six million a month that's only going to go another six to eight ten months or so so what can you tell us about that 46 million we got last year from FEMA uh, last week yeah that's a great question so the current hotel program we've been working with our housing partners across the state uh, to identify what a transition plan is for it the program as you mentioned in its current state is not sustainable um, for several different reasons. Uh, we will be returning to tourism here in the state of Vermont and the number of hotel rooms that are available will decline. And it's just also not financially 
um, or programmatically um, sustainable. Uh, we submitted a proposal to the legislature yesterday, which um, begins to reintroduce, reintroduce some of the eligibility um, criteria um, as we go forward uh, beginning in June, um, and for those who are currently in the hotels beginning in July. Um, over the next couple of weeks we, and months, we'll be working with our housing partners to help make the transition of this emergency housing program to something that is more sustainable and also uh, works to uh, imp get folks uh, into permanent housing versus what is really an, a program intended for emergency or short-term housing. And so the 46 million is just going to continue along with what's happening right now, basically paying rent for another six to eight months or so? The 46 million will be used uh, in that transitionary process um, to transition from the hotel program uh, to a more long-term sustainable process. Well, what does that mean, transition? Does that mean purchasing motels, or uh, what can you tell me about that? Uh, it will be used uh, to, cur to current for the individuals who are currently housed and in, the, and in the future, but it will see a declining program as we see other funds that have been introduced, increasing the number of available units through um, what the governor has proposed as a longer-term housing plan. Okay, thank you. Howard, just keep in mind, uh, that is part of uh, the plan we put forward uh, to, um, to use the billion dollars uh, that we're receiving that's flexible, uh, the YARPA funding. Uh, we, we received $2.7 billion uh, in, in, in its entirety, uh, but a billion is much more flexible for us. And one of the initiatives, uh, along with uh, broadband, uh, uh, climate uh, change mitigation, uh, water, uh, sewer and storm water provisions in, in the economy, uh, was housing, uh, about 250 million dollars for housing and uh, a good portion of that would be to uh, provide for more permanent housing in the future rather than spending the way we have been over the last year uh, upwards to over 70 million dollars for uh, temporary housing for those who are homeless we want more permanent housing so uh, we would take a uh, at least half of that uh, 250 million to build out more permanent housing for those who are homeless. And is that a combination of purchasing motels as well as it, um, possibly building? It could, it could, it, yeah. There's, there's a number of different in, initiatives within the plan. Um, some of it could include buying existing uh, motels and, and refurbishing. Uh, some could be used for existing housing and upgrading. Uh, some could be used for building new housing uh, as well. So it's all the above. Right. Okay, well, thank you both. Aaron Tanko, Vermont Baker. Um, I was recently decided to reopen college campuses to, um, you know, visitors who are touring the campus. Um, why did you decide to make that change now? Like, what what inspired uh, your confidence that it was safe to have people, especially potentially out of staters, um, on campus visiting the facility? I'll let Dr. Levine answer that. But um, but as you know, Aaron, uh, we have uh, moved forward. Uh, we want to have more welcome more people into the state. Uh, those who are vaccinated can freely travel in and out of the state. Uh, those who are not uh, need to have a test before they come uh, and uh, so that we can get back to something normal. So uh, we're encouraged by that and it's one small step forward in that regard. <clears throat> yes, and that's one of those uh, sort of administrative operational decisions that campuses on their own make as well to figure out if they want to have um, opportunities for people to visit as a part of a recruitment strategy. We have noted over months now that well under 5% of our new cases of COVID in Vermont come from travel. So it's a very minimal contributor to cases. I'm happy to report that today we are at a rate of about 120 per 100,000 for cases 
which is below the U.S. average, which is now in the 130s per 100,000. Uh, but keep in mind, we were just recently higher than that. Uh, so it's not as if uh, a student within Vermont visiting uh, would not present any greater challenge than a student visiting from out of state. And obviously, people coming from out of state are still needing to adhere to our travel requirements. So we felt that this was not a high-risk proposition and would benefit the universities and colleges. So are families of students who are currently, you know, college students at a campus, are, are those families allowed to visit their, um, you know, their sons and daughters? I would say that it has to do with the rules that the campus has set. Um, because they can set their own rules regarding um, how open their campus is and how much visitation goes on there. Um, again, we have a travel policy for the state that people should be adhering to if they're coming from out of state to visit. But beyond that, I think it's more of a college level decision about what they're doing on their own campus. Okay. Um, and the state also made the decision to um, allow out-of-state college students to get to sign up to get the vaccine um, but with that registration opening on April 29th and the semester ending early to mid-April uh, mid-May um, do you think that these students will be able to get fully vaccinated before they have to leave for the summer it depends on when on a number of factors when their semester ends and they had planned on leaving. It depends on what vaccine is available to them. And if after today's deliberations, Johnson & Johnson is freely available to all members of the college age population and the state acquires enough of it uh, through its own allocation as well as through the federal pharmacy allocation, uh, how many doses are available. We are uh, well, wanting to work very closely with the colleges to make sure that if we have sufficient vaccine, we can actually allow that uh, deployment to occur in a way that will benefit uh, their campuses and all of the students who are still here. So a um, lot of factors in play here, but our goal is to be as helpful as possible and to provide vaccine when we can. And are there any kind of on campus or within walking distance clinics planned uh, on college campuses? I mean, you know, not only for the out of staters, but for the students that are on campus that usually live in Vermont. Yeah, all I can ask you there is to stay tuned because as we understand the Johnson & Johnson situation better and the amount of vaccine uh, from the presidential calls that the governor is on every week, we'll be able to comment more on that. Okay. Uh, Deputy Secretary Samuelson wanted to say something as well. Aaron, in addition to the availability of the Johnson & Johnson coming aboard, which will give us new opportunities to explore with our college campuses, we've, we've worked hard to ensure that the vaccine um, is located in, a, in close proximity to uh, many of our campuses. So for example, for the University of Vermont, um, it's located at the Doubletree, which is just um, a short distance from campus in Middlebury, um, around the Middlebury College. It's also located within the town of Middlebury. So I feel confident that those students um, who are on campus now, um, regardless of the move that we go forward with, um, will have access close to, uh, to where they, they live um, and access close to the campus. Aaron, if I could, uh, okay. Aaron, Aaron, if yeah, I could also ahead. add, um, yeah. just think it's important for everybody to understand. You know, the Moderna and Pfizer uh, has first and second dose. Um, so, if they were, if these college students uh, were interested in having their first dose, let's say, they could get their second dose back in their home state. It's not something magical. It's not something different. The first dose is exactly the same thing as the second dose. Uh, and the other states uh, have seemingly uh, more supply than we do and less demand in many, many states. So we're blessed uh, in some respects uh, that we have such a high demand uh, for the vaccine. But on the other side of that, we just don't have enough supply 
uh, so that we can uh, get it in the arms of those who are willing in uh, as quick as we'd like. It's just a, it's a, it's a, just a math problem. Uh, we don't have the supply uh, need, that we'd like to have. So we're working on that, and, uh, but it shouldn't preclude anyone from at least having their first dose because they can go again uh, back to their home state and have their second dose very easily. And just to be clear, you know, when you're on the state website, can you kind of specify that you're only signing up for the first dose appointment, or would you kind of have to cancel the second dose appointment if you made one out of state, or how would, how would that work? Yeah, I'll let Deputy Secretary Samuelson answer that one, but I believe uh, you don't have to make your second appointment, but I'll let her answer that. Uh, in the majority of cases, uh, uh, when you go for your first dose, you schedule your second dose. So it would be at that point that you would indicate that you would be getting your second dose um, in another state or another location. So the system is set up to really accommodate um, the desire of students to get their first dose uh, in Vermont and if they choose to get their, their second dose uh, at their home state to indicate that at the, the time that they have their appointment. Okay, thank you. Greg Lamoureux, the county carrier. Thank you. Good morning, Governor. Uh, I guess this afternoon, uh, good afternoon, Governor. Um, we have a local municipality that took ownership of a property by a tax sale last year. There were people squatting in the home and uh, without a lease, the municipality was not able to evict because of the state's eviction moratorium. Meanwhile, the municipalities had to, you know, maintain the property uh, they're, they're not able to put it up for sale to get the property back in the tax roll. Uh, they're having to pay the utilities, costing taxpayers more money, and the taxpayers are really kind of taking it on the nose. I'm, I'm wondering when you expect the current eviction moratorium to be lifted. Yeah, um, this is a source of frustration for, for many. Uh, I know of many individuals that are facing the exact same scenario. Um, but, but the vast majority of, of people we've been able to help over the last uh, 12 months uh, has been substantial. Um, so a lot of it depends on the, the courts themselves. The courts are now just reopening uh, and can hear uh, some of those eviction cases. Uh, but I'm not clear uh, in terms of, I just can't remember uh, what, um, what our process is at this point in time. And I will reach out to anyone that may be listening on our side that might be able to answer that. I'd appreciate that. Uh, um, maybe just I, wait, I Greg. We might have somebody on right now that might be able to answer it. Governor, this is Secretary Curley, and um, I, I don't want to attempt to try to, to get into the weeds on this one um, on this call, but I would be more than happy to offer offline to connect and connect you with Commissioner Hanford. Uh, to see if he might offer a perspective on this. Okay, great. Thank I'm you. Much okay. uh, Governor, a, a quick follow-up on uh, a, a question I've asked a few times. Uh, it, it sounds like with the current labor shortage, it's going to be hard to get people to fill the roles for summer camps. Um, we've heard week after week, you know, that the work search requirement is going to be reinstituted shortly. Uh, but we haven't really heard anything concrete. When can we expect a concrete answer on, on when that's going to be reinstituted? Yeah, it'll be within the first two weeks of, uh, of May, and we'll have more information on this next week. But, uh, but I think for those listening, uh, the work search requirement will be uh, reinstituted uh, within the first two weeks of May. So prepare for that. All right, that's my two questions. Thank you, Governor. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Kat, WCAX. Hi, I had a question that probably is for Dan French. How many schools will be going back to in-person learning once spring break wraps up this week? And what's holding districts back at this point? Uh, hi, Kat. Uh, we're not sure yet. Um, as you know, we do a monthly survey uh, to measure the amount of in-person, and that survey closes at the month at the end of the month. So. Uh, we'll have a better understanding of uh, what's going on relative to uh, the transition to more in-person once uh, we get the data back from that survey, and I'll be reporting on that in early May. 
Um, you know, but the issues of uh, what's holding them back, I think, is just, you know, we've had, particularly the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, elevated case counts and uh, schools, you know, have learned to operate in those kinds of conditions, but it's certainly uh, been hard to make additional progress on uh, coming back to more in-person um, when schools have been cycling back and forth from hybrid and remote and so forth. So um, I'm optimistic we have the right policy tools in place uh, to enable more in-person and certainly you know, vaccination is contributing to a pretty, uh, you know, regular increase in the conditions that schools are operating in. So I'm optimistic we will see a steady increase in in-person here in a couple, couple of weeks. Governor, I believe in your inaugural address, you had a goal of April to get everyone in the classroom full time. And that window, of course, is closing fast here. What comments do you have for districts who have not yet made the decision to go back to full in-person learning? Well, anecdotally, we're hearing that there are going to be some coming back to in-person instruction, and I, I appreciate that effort. And again, you know, this is a, um, there's, there's no um, playbook on this. There's no roadmap in some respects uh, for the pandemic, uh, and we're doing the best we can with the, with the information we have at the time. And uh, we were in a much uh, different place back in January. In some respects, we didn't have all the variants uh, that we're seeing today. So I know the, uh, the schools, the districts, the superintendents, and all other staff are doing their very best uh, to get back uh, to in-person instruction. Uh, and we'll leave it uh, to them uh, to decide. But uh, again, I'm encouraged by what I'm hearing at this point. Anecdotally, uh, there'll be more coming into uh, in-person instruction when they return from uh, this April vacation. Secretary French, do you believe there will be districts that do not at all for the rest of the school year go back to full in-person? Yeah, I don't, I don't think when you say districts, I mean whole districts, I don't think that's likely. Uh, schools, on the other hand, yeah, I'm not sure. There'll, there'll definitely be issues of staffing and so forth that have to be sorted out. but. You know, the, the governor's uh, observation is the same as mine, that everyone's really working hard at this. Uh, it's been challenging a little bit in the last couple of weeks with the conditions improving, but I think, you know, the, the tools are there, uh, the conditions are improving, and we'll see an increased effort on this in the coming weeks. But I, I think it's also important to acknowledge, you know, particularly as we're working with the federal dollars that are, are you know, clearly targeted uh, at states and districts around the country that never were open at all, that our schools have been essentially open from the beginning and have been working through really challenging circumstances, uh, the up and up and down. So the, the pandemic, uh, you know, as the governor mentioned, the new variants and so forth. So it's continued effort. Um, it's really been working really well. So I just I have a lot of confidence that they're doing the best they can and uh, with that we will provide the support they need and we have the right tools in place for them to uh, enact more in person. What promise do you have for parents who are waiting for their children to go back to full in-person learning and are frustrated at the moment. Yeah, no, I feel for them. And, uh, you know, it's essentially uh, the, the target of our, our recovery plans is we really want to re-engage with all our families. So I would just say, you know, be patient, work closely with your, your schools, your teachers. I know they're anxious to provide those supports as best they can. Um, and, uh, you know, just be patient and uh, stay active and work with your school board and so forth uh, to make sure that the needs of students are being met. Thank you. And also take advantage of the uh, summer camp opportunities that we are, um, are um, laying out at this point in time and are developing. I think that this will help uh, parents as well as the uh, students uh, transition through this summer. Guy Page, Compass, excuse me, Chronicle of the Vermont State House. Governor, two readers say that they have been denied access to their child's graduation ceremonies because they have not been nor plan to be vaccinated. Would you or Secretary French please say whether non-vaccinated attendees will, will be allowed at public school graduations? And if so, under what conditions? Yeah, all I can do is comment on what our gathering limits are. You know, we put our plan forward and allows for a certain number of people um, to gather in one place, both inside and outside at certain stages uh, with the vaccination process in place. 
uh, and those limitations are based on those who are unvaccinated. So I don't know. The schools obviously um, have to do what they think is best. And, uh, and I know there's some more guidance going out uh, this afternoon uh, for schools and graduations. So I don't know what uh, limitations uh, the school districts or schools themselves will implement. But, um, but we're trying to find a path forward so that they can have um, a somewhat normal graduation. Secretary French. Yes, I think, um, you know, for the most part, it will be closer to normal, certainly, than last year. But um, our guidance that is coming out this afternoon basically follows the Vermont forward uh, limitation. So, Guy, I don't think there's been any graduations yet, um, but uh, they, they, there will be some in May, certainly, and that would fall under sort of step two of the Vermont forward. Uh, so districts would have an option, certainly, on indoor, um, unvaccinated people is one per 100 Per square foot um, and then any number of vaccinated and then outdoor they certainly have greater flexibility so and then come June uh, certainly when most of graduations after after June 1 the the numbers expand up from there so I'm I'm optimistic that the uh, Vermont forward plan our guidance that falls under it will provide districts uh, sufficient flexibility to hold graduations uh, that look a lot more normal than than last year so you're saying that right right now or in may it'll be one unvaccinated person per hundred square feet in indoors yes our guidance follows the vermont forward plan so if you're looking for that specificity at this moment i just encourage you to go to the vermont forward plan uh that that describes the uh, gathering uh context limitations and so forth that uh, all groups in vermont will fall under uh, going forward and Secretary French, the State Board of Education this week ruled that four local school districts must pay tuition to three different religious schools pursuant to the Espinosa Supreme Court decision last year. Does this throw the door open to public tuitioning of Vermont's approved independent religious schools for the coming school year? Or will the general prohibition on paying tuition to religious schools continue? Well, I, I won't comment on the State Board's decision, um, but certainly I think, as you're aware, uh, this is a topic uh, that's been actively being uh, considered before the, uh, the courts in the United States and ultimately the Supreme Court. So I think it ultimately will uh, re you know, remain to be seen how the courts uh, decide this issue. So the Esperanza, the Espinosa was not conclusive in that, in that regard? Uh, it's Sort of beyond my expertise, guy. I guess you know, from my perspective, um, it's, I think we can we can understand that the courts are actively engaged in uh, clarifying this context, and uh, we'll have to be patient, wait, and see how that is ultimately resolved. Okay, thank you. Ingrid, the Valley Reporter. Hi, uh, my question is for Secretary French. Um, can you give us a snapshot or general overview of the graduation in prom guidance? You know, um, what type of information should schools expect to see? Yeah, thanks. Again, the guidance will be coming out this afternoon, but we've been uh, clear in the last couple of weeks uh, in our messaging uh, to school superintendents and principals uh, that the guidance will uh, fall under the general parameters of the Vermont Forward Plan in terms of uh, group size. Uh, but also follow uh, the safety uh, provisions of um, our safe and healthy schools guidance. So um, basically our the guidance that's coming out in, on, uh, this afternoon basically just suggests that uh, these events are encouraged, <clears throat> that uh, districts should consider sort of the intersection, if you will, between the Vermont Forward Plan and the safety and uh, safe and healthy schools guidance. And it speaks to a, just a couple areas of how to operationalize uh, those guidance uh, documents in the context of uh, both graduation and events like prom. Okay, thank you. And I have one more question. I'm not totally sure who it would be for, but um, can private businesses require proof of vaccination, uh, sorry, require proof of vaccination before letting people into bars, restaurants, gyms, and other types of businesses? Yeah, more of a legal uh, question. and. Um, I don't know if Secretary Curley has the answer to that, but uh, I believe we um, are allowing businesses to determine that on their own uh, because we still have a mass mandate in place and for inside, so that uh, that continues to be the case. 
Yes, Governor, okay. uh, you're correct. We're, our interpretation is that private businesses are permitted to require proof of vaccination if they so choose. Okay, and I just have one follow-up. Um, speaking of gyms, uh, when will fitness classes resume, and will that be after July 1st? I, what was yeah what was the question again maybe oh i'm sorry um just speaking of of gym uh when will fitness classes be able to resume and will that be after july 1st they, they can um they're open at this point in time and if they follow the vermont forward plan uh can incrementally have more people as we move forward so uh, as long as they adhere to the guidance, uh, they can they can have those classes now. Is that, do I have that correct, Secretary Curley? You sure do. Great, thank you very much. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes. Good afternoon. I have no questions this afternoon. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Devin Bates, Local 22, Local 44. Yeah, question for Governor Scott. Yesterday in the House Committee on Health Care, uh, parents and pediatricians gave testimony on lengthy wait times in the emergency room for children in a mental health crisis before they're connected with treatment. Um, and from what I'm hearing, uh, Dr. Ritu, who's on the call, he said these wait times are an issue that have kind of fluctuated even before the pandemic. Um, but with 30% of beds at adolescent inpatient programs temporarily cut right now, um, have there been discussions to eliminate some of these barriers and uh, try to help these wait times go down a little bit for these kids? Yeah, we're very concerned about this, uh, something that we've been highlighting since the start of the pandemic uh, about the mental health of our kids in particular. And uh, that's why we were trying to get more in-person learning uh, so that they could get back connected with their with their peers and uh, other students and and more uh, normalcy in a lot of respects. So uh, this, uh, this isn't a surprise, it's unfortunate. Uh, we're doing everything we can uh, to try and open up more of these uh, uh, facilities, uh, but the pandemic is driving a lot of that as well. So uh, the quicker that we get out of this, the quicker we'll get back to somewhat normal. But, but we had uh, some issues uh, previous to the uh, pandemic, and uh, as I've said consistently, uh, all the, these problems that we faced before, whether it's workforce challenges or demographics, um, existed pre-pandemic, and they're going to be with us after the pandemic. So uh, we're going to, that's why we want to put our plan in place to try and address some of these issues like housing and, and uh, climate change mitigation and our water sewer and storm water, as well as uh, the economy. And, uh, and broadband. So um, that's why we put that billion dollar plan forward. Um, Dr. Levine, anything to add to that or Deputy Secretary Samuelson on the uh, facilities and mental health challenges? You're correct. We are seeing um, an exacerbation in, uh, in mental health. It's not just due to the 30% the of the beds that are closed, but an increase um, in the number of individuals who are in the emergency rooms. What I can say is the Department of Health and the Department of Mental Health are working closely together um, right now um, to and working uh, to mitigate the current standards that exist for those 30 beds um, to see whether they can open up more of them. Um, in addition to that, we've been working, and Dr. Tu can probably speak to this, with our community partners and our designated mental health agencies and other support services to really bolster the community-based options that, that are available. Um, again, we take this very seriously, and we will uh, continue to look at how we can address it uh, both now and into the future. Yeah, this is uh, Dr. Ritu. Thank you for the question, and I agree with everything that's been said. Uh, there have been a number of initiatives that are looking at multiple different uh, places in the flow of care uh, to remove obstacles, and many of them uh, that we heard in the testimony yesterday are directed at trying to uh, keep kids from getting into an emergency situation in the first place and try to offer good mental health care upstream of it being a full-fledged emergency. And then uh, I just had a question.
quick question as well from a viewer that I believe should be pretty straightforward. They were wondering what happens to Vermont college students who go to college out of state. They receive their first shot out of state, um, but then they need their second after they return back to Vermont. What should those students do? Um, they just wanted some clarification on that. Yeah, just just have them call in and make an appointment and we will uh, be able to give them their second dose. Great, thank you, that's all I had. Avery, WCAX. My question is kind of a piggyback off of the vaccine passport question. Some companies like IBM are designing digital health passes uh, that could be used for entrance in events like sporting games. Governor, would you feel comfortable with this kind of technology being used in Vermont? Yeah, I think this is somewhat of an open question. Um, you know, we're all going to be facing at this point in time. I, um, you know, we're using some what of a passport at this point for travel. We're saying that if you're vaccinated, fully vaccinated, you can travel in and out of the state uh, without uh, any testing. Um, so we're utilizing that. We're, we're encouraging that for uh, the step process to the 4th of July when, um, when we're going to be increasing uh, the gathering sizes, but it's going to be somewhat unlimited uh, in terms of uh, outdoor in particular, uh, the number of people who can gather who are vaccinated. So I think uh, this is uh, the, the path forward, um, but we're, we're going to have this debate, I think, uh, in the future uh, as to whether there should be or um, something that is utilized with a passport of, of this sort. But, but, um, but from my standpoint, I think uh, uh, we know uh, that this uh, pandemic, the, the virus itself, is not going to be uh, magically uh, wiped away. It's going to be with us for quite some time, uh, years to come. Um, so we're going to have to deal with it in some way. So um, I'm encouraged uh, by what I'm seeing and uh, we'll have this debate moving forward. And a second question for you. House Bill 128 or the LGBTQ Panic Defense Bill is moving through the legislature right now. If that reaches your desk, would you sign it? Yeah, I have no reason not to unless there's something technical wrong with the bill, but everything I've seen thus far, um, it wouldn't uh, preclude me from signing it. Thank you, that's all I have. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. I don't see uh, Commissioner Goldstein on the list, but perhaps you and or uh, Secretary uh, Curley could answer the question about the UI, USCIS lifting the, uh, the, the Vermont um, Center's um, uh, completion of the EB-5 uh, immigrant yeah, fortunately, um, projects. Uh, yeah. So I was just wondering if you could summarize what, what it means in a practical sense. Yeah. Fortunately, I think uh, Commissioner Pichek is on, and he can uh, he can describe uh, what happened and um, the effect of that on Vermont. Commissioner Pichek. All right, great. Yeah, thank you, uh, Governor, and and uh, thank you, Tim, for the question. So, you know, we take this as a really encouraging development. Uh, the argument that we have been making for some time about the way we see the facts and the way we see the law um, was really finally agreed to by USCIS and granting the motion to reconsider and withdrawing the previous termination. Uh, so it has to go back to uh, an internal office with USCIS, but you know, for all practical purposes, it's directing that office to rule in our favor. And, uh, and it's a big win for the investors, uh, really. I mean, they no longer have the fear that uh, if they were granted a conditional uh, visa, that it will, would be taken away. Uh, and those that have not yet received uh, a visa now have the assurance that their uh, application will go through USCIS with the regional center to support them. So it's a really big, uh, really big win for the investors, and uh, we're really happy that USCIS, um, you know, agreed with our position. How many investors in that second group that are still even waiting for a, a visa? Do you know? Yeah. So we thought, you know, there could be. There are likely hundreds of investors that were impacted. You know, there were there were probably three or four or five hundred investors that had gotten a, uh, a a conditional visa that maybe were at risk uh, that it would be clawed back if USCIS went that way. There's probably another 100 to 200 that are still in the process of getting uh, their visa in the first place. 
uh, and those obviously are, are more directly at risk because they haven't been issued um, they haven't been issued a, a, a conditional visa even or a conditional green card at this point uh, does it affect any any actual projects in Vermont either going forward or or in in process at the moment or is it just so, really you know, the about the investors it's really I mean you know it's uh, it's beneficial to all the stakeholders uh, you know, when, when the investors invest, they're anticipating getting, you know, conditional residency. They're anticipating, um, you know, an, a financial investment as well. Uh, so if they were unable to get uh, their immigration status, you know, that really uh, puts the projects in a bind as well. That was the primary reason these investors, uh, you know, invested with the project. So it's good for the investors. It's good for the individual projects that were impacted, uh, which includes Mount Snow, uh, Trap Family Lodge, and uh, you know, a couple of different projects at JP Resort. So uh, it is good for uh, the investors, but it's good for the projects. It's good for those communities also where those projects are located, knowing um, that, you know, there won't be uh, any uh, uh, impact on those projects. So those projects uh, potentially could go forward then that were, were halted by this? Yeah, exactly. I mean, they can, their investors can go forward to get their, uh, get their, um, uh, immigration status. There won't be requests to withdraw from the project. You know, the projects won't have to come up with money to try to refund the investors. You know, it seems like everybody now will continue, you know, in the direction that they uh, were hoping to. Yeah, great. I was trying to get, just trying to get a sort of a practical sense of what, it, what, what this would mean. All right. Thank, thank you, Commissioner BJ. Appreciate it. Yeah, Tim, uh, just yeah, to add a little bit to that, um, as you recall, as you remember, to remind people, uh, we inherited this problem four years ago when I came into office, um, and we have not disagreed that uh, we want to shut down the regional center. We don't want to be in charge of that. Uh, we think someone else should do that. We have never disagreed with that. It was just the timing. They wanted to shut it down immediately. Uh, we thought we should unwind this in a methodical way uh, to protect those involved. and. Uh, and that was our argument all along. It wasn't that we wanted to continue uh, to run this regional center. We just wanted to uh, to make sure that we protected the investors and projected, uh, protected the, the projects that were uh, went into this in a legitimate way. And want to and it's been helpful in some respects for the trap trap uh, lodge and uh, trap family lodge and uh, and others uh, throughout Vermont. So uh, we didn't want to penalize them. So we think this is a was a reasonable request, and we're happy uh, that they took this action. When do you, uh, it, assuming everything goes goes um, smoothly, when would you expect to unwind the regional center? Uh, well, just as quick as we possibly can. Uh, Commissioner Pichek, uh, do you have a timeline for that, or are we still waiting to hear? I mean, yeah. this doesn't mean that we're going to, they're going to grant our request, although we're expecting they will. Uh, this means that they're yeah. going to hear this case. Yeah, that's right, Governor. And, you know, Tim, to your question, I mean, we're already in the process of unwinding it. Uh, you know, if you, if you think about what we're doing, we're not taking on new projects, as the governor said. We're supporting the current projects. The current projects have raised all their money. They've deployed it to build the programs. Uh, they're at this point, you know, waiting for um, the investment returns to come in and, and they're repaying their investors and they're waiting for their immigration status. So, we're keeping track of that. We're filing, you know, reports with USCIS as necessary. But, you know, in all practical purposes, we're already in that process of winding it down. And it's really going to be um, complete when the final investor gets uh, their petition. So that could be, you know, it's probably over well over a year from now. But uh, but we're in that process uh, as we speak, really. Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. I actually don't have any questions today. Uh, appreciate your time and hope you have a great weekend. Thanks, Tom. Greg, the Bennington Banner. Yes. Hello, am I on? Yes, you are. Okay, thank you very much, Governor. Um, thanks for your patience. Uh, two questions, uh, one for you and I think one for Secretary French. Uh, Governor, the legislature has been tackling how to implement a new per-pupil waiting formula for school funding, and those new weights could impact proper education property taxes depending on the district. Since whatever legisl the legislature decides is going to come to your desk, what do you think is the right approach to putting those new weights in place? 
Yeah, you know, this is a, an interesting uh, situation, and, and I don't uh, necessarily disagree uh, with the waiting um, type of approach, uh, but I don't know uh, what the ripple effect is uh, of this. And uh, I might ask Secretary French to comment on this at this point in time, if he's the appropriate okay. person. Yeah, thank you, Governor. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a complex study, um, and the implications are significant. And as you point to, Greg, uh, that's why we've been testifying in favor of uh, doing an implementation study. I don't know what the right answer is on how to implement the new weights, uh, but I know it is complex. It affects special education funding, and certainly uh, the variation uh, and the impact on different districts is going to be significant. So it's going to require uh, some thoughtful effort on the part of the General Assembly to, to create a plan to implement the weights. Right. Um, without getting too wonky, um, there were some questions this week about the new weights, particularly those addressing students and um, um, it's an economic disadvantage. Uh, what's your level of confidence in the UVM story, uh, the UVM study, as a basis for addressing funding equity moving forward? Well, I think the study's uh, very well done. I've been involved, um, you know, certainly as the contractor that basically initiated the study, but also working closely with the researchers uh, that include researchers not only at UVM but uh, national level researchers. So, I think the study is uh, exceptionally well done. Um, and, but again, it's a very complex issue, uh, and the application of the study is what needs to be evaluated by the General Assembly, and it's going to require some focus effort to do that in a thoughtful way. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Governor. That's, that's my question for the day. Thank you, Greg. Cameron Paquette, St. Albans Messenger. Yeah, hi. Actually, uh, my questions have all been answered at this point. Thank you. Good news. Thank you. Eric, Times Argus. Yes, Governor. Uh, with the demand around the country in some places, easing off. Have there been any discussions or are there any plans that you're aware of about funneling those unwanted doses to a place like Vermont, which still has high vaccine demand? Um, you know, I've had some conversations with the, uh, the pharmacies, some of the pharmacies in Vermont, uh, and they are, um, we had asked them to take their whole allotment and then share them with us from the state supply standpoint. Uh, they're going to uh, work with us on that. Um, so they indicated that they may be asking for more if we need it. Um, and uh, and I spoke with the uh, second gentleman uh, as well, as you might have uh, have read, and I brought up uh, the fact that we could use more uh, in this state, at least in the short term, uh, to get more uh, vaccinations in the arms of uh, those who are willing. Uh, because we didn't we don't have the same type of problem that, it seems as though uh, the list is growing longer every day of states uh, that have uh, uh, more supply than demand. We have the opposite problem. So um, we, uh, we would uh, be willing, uh, obviously, uh, to ramp up as necessary. We have plans in place to do so if we receive more supply. So I sent that message uh, through to the, through the uh, second, second gentleman uh, to the VP and, and to the president. Okay, thank you. Aaron Calvin, store reporter. Hi. Um, yeah, my question is about actually um, the housing market in Stowe right now. Um, there was a huge jump in out of state home buyers in 2020, um, and it's putting a lot of unprecedented pressure on the market. And I'm wondering if the state is, you know, watching that right now, if there are any concerns about the pressure that might be putting on infrastructure or, um, you know, any problems that might be causing for um, the kind of like affordable housing development that area really badly needs, especially when their main challenge is um, land acquisition. Yeah. Um, you know, again, uh, this is uh, the ripple effect of uh, some of the real estate market. Uh, is going to impact uh, some of those more vulnerable populations. And that's another reason why we have our plan to put forward uh, spending provisions within the billion dollars uh, that we, uh, we are advocating uh, with the legislature on uh, is to address those. I mean, this is, again, this is a once in a century 
um, or once in a lifetime, really, opportunity uh, to change uh, the state's trajectory and see economic growth in every corner of the state. So that's why we want to put money in broadband, uh, $250 million there, $250 million for housing uh, that would include uh, more affordable housing uh, for the workforce as well as uh, for those uh, who are homeless. Um, and uh, other initiatives, water, uh, sewer, and stormwater, uh, that those are the infrastructure needs uh, to build out uh, some of the housing. So, um, you know, that's, that's why we develop this plan. Uh, we want to make smart investments that will have a, a tangible impact on Vermont. This is a transitional time for Vermont. And so if the legislature doesn't like that plan, uh, to invest in housing, broadband, climate change, and water and sewer infrastructure, um, we're waiting to see what their plan is. Uh, and we want it to be in a transparent way so that everyday Vermonters can understand what we're going to do with this $1 billion of flexible money uh, for these recovery needs. So uh, you bring up a good point. I think uh, Stowe has been impacted along with other areas of the state, and but you still have needs uh, for uh, low-income housing. Um, you have homelessness uh, as well as needs for uh, those uh, the, the blue-collar workforce. Um, so we want to be able to put our plan forward to help in that regard. All right, thank you. Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Governor, you mentioned earlier your concern with some waning vaccine demand in some parts of the state, including the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, can you detail what you're seeing here in comparison to other parts of the state? Well, it's not just uh, there in the Northeast Kingdom, but, um, but we have seen um, some hesitancy, um, a lack of, uh, of folks stepping up to make uh, appointments and so forth. Uh, but I will say um, the some of the strategy that we've put into place is working. Um, we are uh, able to utilize a lot of the local EMS and going out directly and, and trying to meet them where they are, and, and it seems to be making a difference. And uh, we're going to continue with that strategy. We're going to continue uh, to focus uh, on, I think, uh, again, next week, you'll see uh, maybe some uh, pop-up sites uh, where we're going to vaccinate uh, people in the Northeast Kingdom next week if the J&J &J opens back up and uh, the pause is lifted. So uh, stay tuned on that, but, um, but we, you know, our mission is uh, to get as many people vaccinated as possible. And in those areas where we're seeing a lack of, uh, of interest, uh, we're trying to develop a, a strategy uh, to, to, to increase the demand. Do you want to add anything? Uh Go ahead. Yeah, I was, I was going to say you, you mentioned stay tuned and, and earlier uh, Deputy Secretary Samus and Commissioner Levine um, specifically mentioned Essex County and perhaps Tuesday. Um, what, what would those potential plans look like for the Johnson & Johnson? And yeah, where I, should uh, residents there be paying, staying tuned to um, for sign-up opportunities and, and details? Yeah, I don't want to get... To out too far ahead here because I really don't know. I don't want to get people's hopes up because if uh, if the committee uh, decides or the CDC and the FDA uh, decide not to move forward with the uh, Johnson & Johnson, we won't have the supply we need uh, to get out uh, and to use the strategies that we're planning. So you should we should know more by tomorrow morning and certainly we'll be putting out a press release at that point in time and uh, have something up on uh, you know social media uh, uh, channels, and so just stay tuned. We'll get something to you. So over the weekend, uh, you should look um, and 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 uh, continue to to check your email uh, because we'll be putting out a, a press release on on what we foresee over the next uh, week or so. Okay, thank you very much. Alan Flanders, seven days. Hi, thanks. I had a quick question about um, the vaccine gender gap. This topic has received a fair amount of news coverage over the last week, and it, um, looking at Vermont's dashboard, it looks like 
women are getting vaccinated at a higher rate than men, um, which reflects what's been seen around the country. I'm just curious as to whether um, you have any sense of if, if that's um, perhaps related to our um, some of the occupations that were given priority initially, or are you sensing that there is uh, more of a hesitancy among men than women in getting the vaccine? Dr. Levine. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that this has been observed lots of places, not just Vermont. <clears throat> if you think about the earliest groups that got vaccinated, um, they involved uh, people working in healthcare and in long-term care facilities. And um, there is a female preponderance in that workforce. If you look at some of the later phases we've had, um, specifically in the education sector, there's again a female preponderance in that workforce. Um, if you look at healthcare in general, historically, uh, just looking at uh, who comprises visits in a typical day, month, or whatever to a doctor's office, there's also female preponderance there. Um, not necessarily because women are sicker or anything like that. Uh, they may be much more attentive to symptoms, much more attentive to preventive care and, and overall health care needs. Uh, so I think, in a sense, <clears throat> the cards were stacked in favor of more women getting vaccinated than men for a whole variety of factors, and I probably haven't mentioned even half of them. Um, beyond that, um, I think what the governor was alluding to earlier when he was talking about EMS and, uh, and elsewhere was ways to enhance vaccine uptake in general and reduce vaccine hesitancy. And if men are more hesitant uh, is one of the reasons because uh, of their lack of um, ability to access the vaccine as readily. Uh, and do we need to design strategies that are innovative that uh, more bring the vaccine to a population then actually have the population seek out where to get the vaccine from. And believe me, everything's on the table when it comes to trying to allow Vermonters to get vaccine in as rapid a fashion as possible. Um, so those are some of my thoughts. Okay, just, just to reiterate, it doesn't sound like then that there is, that the, the state has recognized a hesitancy among men at this point. So. Um, is that fair to say that, or can you not say at this point? I don't know what the data would show. Yeah, oh, if there's anecdotally. Yeah, we recognize the data, which shows that there's less uptake in men than in women. Um, the reason behind that is not always clear. Um, but if there are factors in hesitancy, we're, we're looking for them, and we will try to meet them um, by doing whatever strategy is required. Thanks. That's it. <clears throat> okay. Well, that uh, that concludes uh, today's event. Um, but before we go, I just want to again remind everyone: tomorrow is National Drug Take Back Day. Um, I think during uh, last fall's Take uh, Take Back Day, uh, Vermonters disposed almost uh, 4,500 pounds of uh, unused medication. So. Again, I want to encourage everyone uh, to clean out their uh, medicine cabinets uh, this weekend and get rid of any unused prescriptions. It really does make a difference. So uh, I uh, want you to I encourage you to take advantage of this uh, this weekend. Uh, with that, uh, thank you very much again. Uh, have a, a good weekend and uh, we'll, as we welcome spring back again, and we'll have more on Tuesday. Thank you. <clears throat>